we're realizing that small molecules may have a role for patients with HER2 alterations and maybe Zongertinib and this Bay drug and the NVL330 may be the new wave of the future. Just as much as the efficacy matters, so does the safety, so does the, the toxicity profile. And so one of the things that's exciting, I think, about these small molecule TKIs so far that we've seen is we have not seen any ILD, we have not seen pneumonitis. So that's exciting to be able to tell patients, right? This podcast is for healthcare professionals only and is supported by an independent educational grant from Bayer. Hello and welcome back to the Oncology Brothers podcast. I'm Rahul Gosain. As always, I'm here with my brother and co-host Rohit Gosain. Today, we're diving into our second episode of two-part CME series on HER2-positive non-small cell lung cancer. In our first episode, we explored testing and identifying HER2 alterations with doctors David Cadas and Fernando Lopez-Rios. To build on our initial conversation and focus on treatment options in HER2-positive lung cancer, we're joined by two incredible thoracic medical oncologists, Dr. Isabel Prishigal, from Memorial Sloan Kettering and Dr. Eric Singhi from MD Anderson Cancer Center. Isabel, Eric, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you so much. We're, we're thrilled to be here. Isabel and Eric, welcome. In our last episode, we had a chance to touch on complexities around HER2 alterations, whether that's mutation, overexpression, or even amplification. Now, to kick things off here, Eric, I'll start off with you. What do we mean by HER2 positive disease in lung cancer and why is it so important? Yeah, this is a great question. Uh, You know, we're already taking a page out of the book of breast medical oncologists because we're trying to catch up so quickly with understanding what is HER2 positive disease specific to lung cancer, right? And so we have really anchored in lung cancer for some time talking about HER2 mutations specifically. And I know you guys covered this very nicely in, in the last episode. Um, but that's really been our traditional way of defining HER2 positive non-small cell lung cancer. But that's not to say that there are, aren't, aren't other more meaningful uh, tests that need to be done for defining HER2 positive disease. So ERB2 amplification is just as important. HER2 overexpression is also important. They have clinical implications. Um, but historically, yes, we've been referred to, we've been anchored on this HER2 mutation status. Eric, thanks for setting that stage. Isabel, can you touch on our available options today in this space? And what data do we have to support that? Yeah, so I think I just want to piggyback on what Eric said, that the first thing is being able to appropriately interpret these ongoing, ever-complex, next-generation sequencing panels from alphabet soup of different labs that are doing this, right? So the first thing you want to do is make sure, are you dealing with an EGFR alteration or are you dealing with a HER2 alteration? Because there's EGFR exon 20 insertions, and then there's also HER2, e, it's HER2 exon 20 alterations. Mm-hmm. So that's the first thing. So often you would see if there's e- ERBV2 mentioned, as Eric had said, that's kind of a, a clue that we're going down the HER2 pathway and we're not talking about the EGFR pathway. So first thing is to know what you're dealing with. Second thing is that these HER2 alterations or HER2 mutations are typically seen only in about 2 to 4% of the population. But something that makes it a little bit more unique is that we often see CNS metastases at diagnosis or very quick to have, you know, escape metastatic disease to the sanctuary site there. It's very common. And we think we also see this in patients with HER2 alterations in breast cancer as well. So I think that's something to be mindful of and to make sure that you are, you know, you are getting all of the appropriate staging scans before you commit your patient to a treatment. And Eric had also mentioned HER2 amplification and HER2 overexpression. And as of late, we have approval of trastuzumab durox TCAN for patients that have these exact indications, overexpression or amplification of the HER2 gene. Um, And this is detected on immunohistochemistry testing, right, which is very different than next generation sequencing, DNA or RNA based testing. So it's really important that if for some reason you don't have any alterations on your next generation sequencing testing, that you advocate for yourself and you ask your medical oncology doctor that's caring for you, hey, have you sent my tissue for immunohistochemistry testing to see if I've heard you overexpression or amplification? Because I think that could open up more options for me. Thanks so much for talking about that particular NGS sequencing. 
uh, with regards to where we stand, uh, Isabel. It is extremely important, first of all, to test these patients and then interpret it appropriately. Rahul, as community medical oncologist, we've seen bucket approvals like TDXD, and we've yeah. utilized this in colon cancer, not just in breast cancer and even lung cancer. And not just particularly for ADCs, we have seen catnip like TKIs in breast cancer, but also in colorectal and cholangiocarcinoma. This is important as we are seeing quite a bit of TKIs being also tested in lung cancer space. Okay, before we dive into what's on the horizon, Eric, do patients with HER2 positive disease have equally good response to frontline chemoimmunotherapy or rather we see less responsiveness here? Yeah, that's a really good question. So what are we doing in the first line landscape for patients with newly diagnosed HER2 positive non-small cell lung cancer? Right now, what we have approved is platinum-based chemotherapy. And so that's really the staple for what we're offering patients. That's really what we're pulling and reaching for in our clinic. If we can't offer them a clinical trial, right, we have to take a moment to say, if there's a clinical trial available at your center, at a nearby center, please explore those options. It should not always be a last resort. So that's really important to mention. Now, the addition of immunotherapy is interesting. It's, it's feasible, and retrospective data kind of varies in terms of what we see with what that additional benefit is of adding immune checkpoint blockade to platinum-based therapy. The caution I have with giving that is, you know, if we need to reach or quickly sequence in, uh, and we'll talk more about some of the side effects with TDXD, of course, there's a higher risk or potential of pneumonitis, higher risk of toxicity, right? And so we always want to think about what's most efficacious and what's also balancing safety because for many of our patients, our hope is, is a marathon in terms of the cancer care journey, right? So we want to be able to very smartly sequence our therapies that we have available. And again, this, this is different than what we tend to do for other disease sites. In gastric cancer, we are actually able to combine immunotherapy with trastuzumab, not trastuzumab directly can, but trastuzumab upfront. But then we continue with that anti her therapy, which is what we also do with breast cancer. That's the reason why these clinical trials are so important. Can these treatment options in first line be equally good or, if anything, better? Isabel, you also touched on this idea of over um, amplification or overexpression amplification. We have trust as Mapdirect Stecan that's approved based off Destiny Lung 2. Does the response rate change based on your ERBB2 mutation versus your IHC testing here? So we have not done any cross trial comparisons to kind of determine. I guess, who's going to have a better response rate, whether you have a HER2 mutation, HER2 amplification, or overexpression. But I think retrospectively, looking back at the data, you tend to get a little bit more mileage if you have a HER2 mutation. Um, but that's just me doing cross-trial comparisons that we're really frowned upon. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not worth a shot and that you can't enjoy a response and, and gain some longevity. With, um, with exposure to TDXD if you have HER2 AMP or overexpression. Outside of clinical trials where you've utilized TDXD in upfront settings at all, especially given the responsiveness one sees with this? I haven't. We have a frontline trial, so I've been very fortunate to be able to do that, but I have not off-label done that, no. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with, with is there. It's tough. Uh, you know, I think we're always wanting to move our smarter, more precise versions of medicine into the frontline setting, right? That's what many of our clinical trials are trying to do. Um, the Destiny Lungo 4 study, I think is what is, is probably referring to the phase three study where we're bringing TDXD into the first line setting. We're comparing it to chemoimmunotherapy. Um, hopefully with time, we'll be able to see what that benefit is. Um, but as of now, I am reserving a more targeted therapy for the second line setting and beyond. And again, in this space, there's a lot that's happening. Rohit, you alluded to TKIs, be it for breast cancer or what we use for colon cancer. We're seeing TKIs being used in lung cancer as part of clinical trials as well. Isabel, can you touch a little on these emerging therapies in this space, some potential upcoming options and the data around this? Sure. So I think just before I dive into that, it's important to just remember that I had said that CNS metastases are often seen in about 30% of patients that harbor HER2 alterations. So when we're giving chemo and immunotherapy or we're giving antibody drug conjugates like trastuzumab drugs TCAN, these are kind of big, clunky, clumsy things that these molecules can't get into the blood-brain barrier to penetrate these brain metastases. So unlike osimertinib, which we use for our patients that have EGFR alterations, smaller molecules, tyrosine kinase inhibitors that can penetrate through the blood-brain barrier, the, the HER2 alteration 
you know, approved agents that we have right now cannot. So that's why the addition of these two agents that are sort of getting highlighted now in this space, which I'm so excited to talk about, Zong Gertne based off the Bemian study, and then the Bay 292 based off the Soho 01 study, um, are sort of smaller oral agents, small molecules that have good CNS penetration based off of the data. Um, and there's also another drug that I do want to talk about. It's the NVL330 um, from New Valent, a compound, small molecule compound, also having outstanding CNS penetration preclinical. So I think just as an overarching theme, we are realizing that we're really needing to be able to penetrate through the blood-brain barrier and piggybacking off of our, you know, the EGFR space, we're realizing that small molecules may have a role for patients with HER2 alterations and maybe Zongertinib and this Bay drug and the NVL330 may be the new wave of the future. And um, so the BMEAN study was looking at this in the second line setting, but there is now a BMEAN lung O2 study that's looking at moving this small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitor pill to the frontline setting. So how are we eventually going to sequence Zongertinib and the Bay drug and the NVL330 drug? I don't think we know. I think we need to kind of see how these studies shake out. But the Absolutely. fact that we're just moving from big clunky molecules to small, more refined molecules that can penetrate the blood-brain barrier are what really excite me about this space and excite me for our patients. Well, exciting options available, but again, as of now, FDA approval only is for TDXD in second line, but exciting stuff ahead. We'll see how this all pans out. Eric, with regards to TDXD, as you were talking about pneumonitis, especially when we are treating patients with lung cancer, this hmm. side effects takes definitely a precedence, especially when there's mortality associated with it. Other important side effects are fatigue, nausea, alopecia. And importantly, one has to keep quality of life in mind, especially when we are treating these patients with palliative intent. But these TKIs in general have a different side effect profile, and it's certainly not a class effect. Eric, can you touch on some of the side effects we have seen with SOHO trial or with other TKIs in general? Yeah. So, you know, that's one of the things we got to look at, right? Just as much as the efficacy matters, so does the safety, so does the, the toxicity profile. And so one of the things that's exciting, I think, about these small molecule TKIs so far that we've seen is we have not seen any ILD, we have not seen pneumonitis. So that's exciting to be able to tell patients, right, because we get really nervous about that side effect with TDXD. Um, on the contrary, we are seeing increased rates of diarrhea and rash, um, particularly with the, the Bay ADA drug. Um, the diarrhea was actually quite high. Um, almost a quarter of patients uh, had, had, had grade three and above diarrhea. So that's pretty serious. Um, so we really have to make sure that we're managing uh, the toxicity profile with these drugs, making sure supportive care is just as important as the delivery. But like is, I echo the excitement. I'm very excited about these drugs. Uh, there's been a lot of what I call FOMO in the HER2 space, right? <laughs> Where we're waiting and we're waiting for our NGS results to come. We have this gut feeling and the patient sitting in front of us may harbor an actual genomic alteration. And that could potentially allow them to continue to live their lives quite seamlessly, have a great quality of life, have an oral drug. And then we get the HER2 result back. And right now we don't have an oral drug, right? And so it's frustrating. And so it's nice to be able to say we're on the way there, response rates of almost 70 plus percent with great intracranial efficacy or improved intracranial efficacy than what we have now. Um, so I'm excited. And again, Rohit, we've used some of these TKIs, not exactly the ones that are being studied, but TKIs in general in the community. So I think there's going to be this sense of comfort around it. Isabel, can I push you a little more about the CNS story? From TDXD to a large ADC, we have seen some good CNS activity when it comes to other disease sites. What are we seeing with these new drug TKIs here? I mean, I think in somebody that has, unfortunately, stage four disease with CNS metastases, if I could offer them Zongertinib or Bay, uh, one of the frontline studies, like if we could get them on lung O2, right? Be me in lung O2 is a study that's looking at Zongertinib in the frontline setting. Um, we know about the CNS efficacy there in preclinical data or looking at Bay or even the new valent drug. These are the smaller molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitors. If we could put this patient on a frontline study with a small molecule inhibitor, that could do one of three things or hopefully all, right? One, prevent CNS metastases or treat the CNS metastases. You're kicking radiation down the curb if you need it, right? You're also, you know, like, what if they have symptoms from that? You're, you're preventing them, them from developing more symptoms. C 
seizures, edema, you know, God forbid, you know, permanent neurologic damage. So I think you're you're really being able to change quality of life and and maybe even quantity, but I don't think we have those numbers yet. And the other thing ends up being the time toxicity. This is an oral agent that patients can take at home. Eric, your thoughts? Again, we're stuck with cross trial comparisons here. I mean, it really depends on a few things. I think the CNS efficacy is going to be huge, right? To com- to try and compare and figure out which drug is going to be best for the patient sitting in front of me. That's something I'm constantly looking at with all the drugs that are coming out. It's it, it's a race now, almost, if you will, of trying to move these small molecule TKIs in the first line setting, trying to push TDXD into the frontline setting. What's going to happen, right? And of course, we still have our platinum therapy. Uh, I think the CNS efficacy matters. I think the toxicity profile matters a lot as well, too. Um, thankfully, our small molecule TKIs are getting so much better than what we had before. We had poseotinib, for example, that was making its way, hopefully, into development in the, down the pipeline. But the toxicity was just too much. The skin rash, the diarrhea, the paronychia, right? As we need to continue to get more selective with the therapies that we're developing, hopefully we can get less of this toxicity. Um, so the delivery is going to be just as important. But I, I wish I had a clear answer for you guys. I just don't know yet. Um, I, I think we just need more data. And I think that's the problem everywhere in the field, especially how field continues to change so fast, whether that's Zengertinib, Bay drug, or Nuvalent, and even TDXD frontline sequencing. One will have to discuss the entire data with the patients and importantly, the side effect profile. And again, at the end of the day, it will be patient shared decision making process. Isabel and Eric, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on this rapidly evolving and complex space of HER2 positive disease in non-small cell lung cancer. For our listeners, let us go over a quick recap from today's discussion. In today's discussion, in our ongoing series of HER2 positive lung cancer with Dr. Isabel Prishigal and Dr. Eric Singhi, we had a chance to focus on treatment options and emerging data in this particular type of non-small cell lung cancer disease. Our current available options include trastuzumab durxtecan based off Destiny Lungo 2, but we eagerly await more treatment options for our patients in this space. Rahul, with more treatment options, particularly with different mechanism of action, sequencing and managing side effect is going to be very critical. But learning from breast cancer and gastric cancer, exposing to multiple anti-HER2 therapies can help our patients live longer. Make sure to check out our first episode in this series where we had a chance to focus more on testing and characteristics of HER2-positive lung cancer. Thanks for joining us. We are the Oncology Brothers. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to find out more, then please look for the Oncology Medical Conversation podcast under the account of core to add Medical Education. Also, don't forget to rate this podcast, subscribe to our channel, and share it with your colleagues. Thank you for listening and see you next time. This podcast is an initiative of core to add and developed by Lung Connect a group of international experts working in the field of oncology. The views expressed are the personal opinions of the experts and they do not necessarily represent the views of the experts' organizations or the rest of the Lung Connect group. For expert disclosures on any conflict of interest, please visit the Courtuette website.